who Thanks, comes to us from, uh, where are you at now, Pico? Still Riverbed. Still Riverbed, yeah, yeah okay. So P Riverbed Pico is, is my mothership, but the presentation today is not about Riverbed. Pico is one of the original uh, Ops Camp Austin and DevOps Days Austin uh, folks, and uh, sh this should be good. Welcome. I don't know if it's going to be good. I'll try to make it entertaining. <laughs> May maybe we'll get to learn a thing or two, maybe. We'll see. Um, so in kind of the true spirit of what we're doing today, um, I want to really start this conversation. It's not about, this is not a talk about a solution or technology. It's, it's kind of really trying to illustrate how we've, where we started, how we've evolved into kind of this monitoring world. And then, um, um, and then really start the conversation. So I would love if we can continue some of that conversation tomorrow in an open space. Kind of understand what what you see in your kind of walk walk of life, and uh, basically what are some things that you've learned. So again, uh, Peko Karanev, um, good to meet you guys. My Twitter handle is bproverb. Um, it, it's not B proverb B. It's uh, it stands for Bulgarian proverb. Ernest is giving me a hard time, but yeah. It's kind of my uh, my little bits of wisdom that my nation has accumulated. I like to share them off of that Twitter handle. Um, so, with that being said, today we're going to talk about some uh, some items about monitoring and uh, how it works, how it doesn't work, and so forth. Uh, so, you know, um, the talk when I pitched the talk was about data visualization, and we'll certainly go over that. But I wanted to kind of lay out some of the uh, some of the foundation before we start talking about tools and how to visualize data with D3 and, you know. But bottom line is the talk is about APIs, how we can make use of them, and then how APIs enable, enable us to build these uh, monitoring tool chains, right? And uh, why did I pick this image? Um, I think over time, we're kind of building things on top of things, on top of things, on top of things. And when it relates to monitoring, we, we, the kind of some of the challenge there is we're starting to speak a different language altogether that maybe only a select few can understand, right? So, uh, so why do we keep building the tower of the monitoring Babylon? Well, there's new applications, new environments, new frameworks that need to be covered. So over time, you know, we, we start with like, oh, let's, let's monitor a backend nodes. We can collect some system stats. Maybe we'll do some application monitoring, and then it's, then it's uh, well, how about we monitor what's happening with these services on the back end? Those, those are interesting. We should probably get notified if something fails, right? So we keep adding these eyeballs on, on things, and it's like, oh, no, the, the user experience is really important. Let's start monitoring that as well, or the network, right? So we're adding these instrumentation points over time, and we're stacking them up together. So. Uh, and uh, <laughs> I took this slide. Uh, it's it, uh, the slide is courtesy to uh, Big Panda, which is a monitoring aggregator. But I went to their site and they had a very extensive, you know, set of other monitoring tools that they integrate. And if you just look at this, uh <laughs> this is kind of the Cambrian explosion period for monitoring data. Like you have these like little silos here and there that do uh, different things. So it's kind of it's fascinating to me. It's uh, how many different monitoring languages that we speak. Um, I'm sure if you squint really hard, you're going to start noticing some of the tools that you're using yourself. Um, but I thought that was cool to just have it all kind of laid out. So what's, what's the issue, right? It's, uh, so what? What's the big deal? We're agile, right? We, we build monitoring into our tool chains. We release things. Uh, and uh, we have two chains, so what, why are we having this talk? Well, again, the talk is about kind of this uh, disjoint, kind of uh, disconnected language that we're trying to speak. And, and then also two chains become fragile. So a little bit of walkthrough of where did we start, right? This everybody, uh, I think everybody's old enough to remember these days, right? If, raise your hand if you've lived in this world for many years. You know, some, may, maybe some of us still live in that world, but it's, you know, I have my system, I have my monitoring tools, everything is kind of a silo, and then we're just shoving data into email. All right, slight detour, but hold your thought there. 
through the course of this research, um, I found that creatures with many eyes are kind of scary to us. I don't know why, but if you look at the monsters, like you have the beholder, right? You have a spider, it's all like we, we, all, we all feel queasy about creatures with many eyes. So let's do a quick test. How many of you guys uh, have, have any of these creatures here I'll use as a character to illustrate some of these other things? Which one would you pick? Raise a hand for the beholder. Does anybody know what a beholder is? All right, some guys do. All right. What about sp a spider? It has whatever, six or eight eyes. Nobody? Medusa? Couple of guys. All right, so maybe this is the bit that you're going to learn today. So beholder is this, uh, uh, it's a creature out of uh, Dungeons and Dragons. Right? It's, it's part of that fantasy myth mythology. And uh, essentially, it, can, uh, it has the properties of Medusa. If it looks at you, it can uh, kind of turn you to stone, right? And it's also very obnoxious because it's, you know, it's angry, it's going after you, has many eyes, so you, you know, it's really hard to kind of escape it. So this is going to be our character that we, uh, that we work with. So what does Be Beholder think of a version one monitoring tool chain, right? Well, he's not very happy, he's kind of angry. Well, he's angry all the time, but you know. He's particularly angry because he gets a uh, uh, mailbox full of email that he ignores and then, you know, life goes on. Okay, cool. What can we do better? Enter the version 2.0 of the monitoring tool chain. Well, still we have our system, a lovely system, whether it's cloud, microservices, whatever. We have our different instrumentation point, whether instru instrumentation monitoring tools, whether that's server, application, network, end user, and so forth. And then we're feeding all the alerting now into a centralized place like ServiceNow or PagerDuty to do incident management. OK, cool. We still get an email to do something about it, right? Um, so what does Beholder think? Well, if Beholder slept, which they don't, he'll appreciate that, right? Because he's not getting a flood of emails and alerts. Things are a little bit more managed. Things are going into queues for different people to work on. So life is a little bit better if he cared. Uh, still, bottom line is uh, an incident still triggers an activity that he has to go take care of. Uh, so still, a lot of the tool chain is actually in his brain. So getting an alert, what do I need to do with it? Well, I need to go look at the data source, what happened? Why these three metrics like this, right? What do I need to do? What action do I need to take? So Again, the bottom line is we've automated some of the data management collection. The, t the tool chain is still in our heads around monitoring. All right, so, uh, wait, did we cover this? Oh, no, okay, yeah. Uh, 2.1 of that is, okay, now uh, alerts are coming into our mailbox, but now we have Slack. We have cool, you know, other places to shove more information at. That's cool. What does Beholder think of that? I love it, you know. I'm sitting in front of my mailbox for nine out of 10 times. Um, and occasionally, you know, I see that things pop up in chat to where I can drop what I'm doing and go take care of an event. Has anything changed? No, I'm just getting more information that I can act on. Okay, that's cool. Maybe everybody's aware of that. That's a plus. Still, the monitoring tool chain is most mostly in my head. What do I need to do given a certain event? Okay, version 2.2. Now I've automated some of the actions that I take, okay? Um, I'm sending event there from PagerDuty to ServiceNow. Maybe my monitoring tools are now smart enough to event and take an action, restart a server. Cool. And, uh, okay, cool. Now I've automated some small percent of what I do. Maybe if this is an isolated server instance kind of getting hosed up, I can restart something and recover things. Still, the tool chain is in my head. I still have to, for the more complex problems, I can't rely on automation to fix, you know, a database getting stuck or, you know, some denial of service event, right? Still, what you do with monitoring data is in your head. How many of you guys are in this world right now? Okay. So in the world of chat ops and pager duty and you're getting 
signal from disparate silo tools, right? Enter 3.0 of the monitoring tool chain. So now we have aggregators. We have things like Grafana, like Prometheus, like Wavefront. So now we have uh, essentially um, to kind of reduce the noise and actually make smarter decisions about our individual data points, we kind of bringing them together, right? So instead of me going and looking at five tools, I'm going to go look at another two or three tools. Uh, and again, some of these are actually doing analytics. Some of actually are just doing dashboarding like Rafana and so forth. Okay, cool. I'm a beholder, a single pane of glasses for the mortals. I don't care, right? <laughs> okay, we've automated things one step further, incrementally. Now we have the aggregators. We're still ma massaging and managing data there. Still the majority of what we do with monitoring data is in our heads, right? Uh, and now you have to actually, now adding aggregators in the mix may actually complicate your life a little bit more because on one hand, it's, you know, you go to less UIs to actually make a decision. On the other hand, uh, now having to deal with data issues, with latency, maybe the source that generated the event, the aggregator received five minutes later, you know, that makes like 10 minutes maybe in total where something happened and you haven't seen it or you haven't been notified. So you have to be aware of these issues when you're, when you're b building your tool chains. How many of you guys live in this world today? So how many of you guys have added the aggregator layer in your tool chain? Okay, a few, cool. All right, so what's the next thing? What's the next big thing? Can anybody guess? You get AI, you get AI, you get AI, right? Everybody gets AI, <laughs> and that's going to fix our problems. Well, I don't know. Uh, I'm suspicious you won't. Uh, what I expect will happen is we're going to add what we claim to be AI. We're going to incrementally improve every chain, every piece of that tool chain. But at the end of the day, the tool chain is still in your head. You still have to, you know, you still have to speak the language of these different tools. Of these, you have to understand these algorithms. You still have to then train other people to understand it. You're still kind of the bottleneck in this, in this equation. Uh, again, this talk is not about uh, a solution. I don't have a solution that I can think of. It's just what I'm observing happening right now. All right, what does Beholder think of that? Just say AI one more time. <laughs> so anyway, so this, is, this was kind of the first part of the, the talk. Uh, Again, in the spirit of what we're doing today, I would love to continue the discussion tomorrow in open space and kind of just see, uh, you know, incrementally what can be done better, what, 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 what actually works, but, you know, can we actually solve some of these uh, additional pain points that are, that are coming up? Generate ideas. All right. Uh, so... The reason I added this part of the talk is, you know, diving directly into APIs, you know, and automating things. It just it, it doesn't really does it solve the core problem of of the monitoring Babylon of speaking different languages. I don't know. I don't know. I don't know if it does. But uh, essentially, the reason why we can build tool chains is essentially APIs. Um, however fragile our tool chains are, however inefficient they are, I mean, ultimately we depend on APIs. So uh, before I dive into this, uh, I'm going to have a little bit of a hands-on, just like here are a couple of APIs, here are some tools that I've used, and then I'm going to show you a quick example of how I've used D3 to create like a custom, little custom widget with a couple of data points. It's actually very easy if you look at it. You know, it's just it's a couple hours of work. But through the course of this experiment, what really kind of uh, was interesting is uh, like. The reason why things are so disjoint is the API languages are different. I mean, there are patterns, but the, in essence, the API languages are different. So every time you're trying to bring you know, one or two or three or five of these tools and then do something with the data, you're dealing with like very different you know, set of data, essentially. Uh, how many of you guys have uh, written against REST APIs? Okay. Excellent. 
All right, so let's look at a couple examples. So this is the an example from the da Datadog uh, API. So the, the on the left-hand side is going to be the request, and the right-hand is going to be a response. So just I'll point out a few things that are that you find like very uh, very common. So the first thing is the good news is that uh, a lot of the tools are now RESTful, you know, accepting and returning JSON. Okay, that's good. Um, in terms of, um, again, how authentication works with these APIs is different. Sometimes it's an API key. Sometimes it's a login. Uh, sometimes it's a token that gets returned by the API on the first authentication. So the authentication part of the uh, of this API ecosystem is, you're gonna, we're going to find that through a couple more examples, it's, it's quite different. Then in terms of the response that you get in, in terms of time series data, uh, it also varies. In general, you basically you're getting some metadata attributes on a list of data points. But for example, when you specify how you query for a time range, what time slice you allow, it's, it's all different. So if you look at what you can get out of New Relic versus Datadog, uh, that part of the navigating time is, is different across all the APIs that at least I've looked at. Uh, how many of you guys have written specifically against Datadog? All right, cool. Is, was it terribly hard to do? Okay. So in your case, it was a developer that, that did the work, not necessarily a system engineer. Okay. Which which I, th I think is fair, but wouldn't it be cool if all of us actually didn't rely on just on developers to write that part? I mean, if, if system engineers could and did some of that work, I think it would be great. But anyway, so this is an example of the Datadog API again, uh, you know, just returning plain, plain text JSON and kind of setting different time interval, uh, a different way to, you know, different attributes return. Uh, here's a new Relic API, and I'm sorry, it's kind of cut off. Uh, but similar idea, right? We, we're providing an API key. Uh, here we're, you know, the request is formatted differently as well. It's not, you know, very JSON-like, but uh, that's what it is. And then um, the response, kind of the thing curious to me was like, well, I have to deal with like time conversion here and like what? But it is what it is. Um, um, and again, this is just returning a, a summary data point. I didn't query for the, uh, for the full time series data. And this is an example from Prometheus. Um, again, you have to squint to look at it. But uh, again, uh, data points are formatted differently. Uh, how we specify time. Uh, is also you're providing a kind of a time zone type uh, query or or time in a time zone or time uh, date time type format. Does this make sense so far? So so everything we've looked at so far, if you look at behind the scenes, is different. Same principles, but different enough to where you if you actually want to code against it, your code will be different. Like you, you parse it differently and all that. All right. Okay, so now to the example. Uh, how many of you guys have played with D3? All right, cool. So nothing, nothing uh, earth shattering here. So, um, but before I dive into D3, uh, there's kind of a, when you're, when you're gonna be building automation and extracting data from the APIs, the first step is like, you kind of have to stumble across all the peculiar peculiarities of the API, learn them, work around them, whatever. So what I found pretty useful for this exercise for me was uh, uh, this uh, tool called ARC, or Advanced REST Client. Uh, how many of you guys have heard of either Postman or ARC? OK, awesome. So this was kind of very neat to actually make sure that my requ requests are being formatted I'm getting what I expect in the response. I'm just iterating over that quickly over the API, so I don't have to, you know, go back and forth between uh, uh, just running curl, curl commands and 
exploring things like a little at a time. So, uh, so what I have here is uh, uh, I'm going against Still Central in this case because this is I have an account there and it's just it was easier for me to to do that. Uh, so again, uh, you create basically the you format the headers, the endpoint. Uh, Arc will also hold the authentication once you establish it. So in this case, I'm not authenticated yet. So uh, you know the first thing uh, I'll do is uh, I'll log in. So this will return some value. So after login, I'll pick the specific monitoring domain that I want to take a look at. Um, and then from this point on, I can essentially, you know, there's, there's usually helper APIs that come with APIs. So in this case, I'm just going to list of what categories available on this particular API, what type of metrics, and so forth. So again, very easy to, you know, before you build automation around the API, whether it's extracting or pushing data, just to, to kind of narrow down on what 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 actually works. Uh, here, I have another request that will just give me a list of memory uh, uh, memory data points for a particular server environment. Any questions so far? Pretty, I mean, pretty straightforward. Cool. All right, next. So once I uh, once I got down how to navigate this particular API and what the requests should be, how to authenticate. Again, that took me maybe like 30 minutes to just experiment quickly with Arc. So uh, I had like these templates then for the request and what I expect as a response. Uh, so the next thing is like, okay, now, okay, I, I'm I'm jiving with this API. I know what what I need to do. Uh, how do I need to, uh, uh, yeah, what do I need to do on the visualization side? So if you haven't played with D3, uh, again, they have a library of really, really advanced and really simple visualization. So if you're trying to build like a really quick and dirty dashboard, uh, very easy to do. So for the sake of, uh, and uh, they actually have really pretty looking visualizations, you know, depending on how complex your data is, is, is it time series, is it event data, and so forth. Uh, but for my experiment, I focus specifically on uh, just a very simple bar chart example, which uh, let's see if I can find it again. Yeah, there it is. All right. So here's a bar chart. Again, you can kind of browse visually, find what you like. And then uh, under these uh, examples, you're going to find all the files that you need. So there's a data file and there's the actual uh, JavaScript HTML file. And I'm probably as novice as, uh, of a JavaScript developer as you can imagine. So largely copied, pasted, changed some attributes to get this working. So my point here is <laughs> it's actually pretty, once you figure out the APIs, I know it's like what it provides. Fairly easy to kind of get D3 hooked in. So I downloaded the index file. Uh, it's, it's running on my machine here. <sighs> so you know, here's the index file. I just copied it um, and then uh, used the API to pull down a, a data set. So first I'll auth authenticate again. Uh, So this tells me, okay, I've successfully logged in. Here's the, the API version that I'm going against. Uh, the next thing is now I want to draw some data. I want to pull some data. Uh, so here's what my, oof, yeah, that's pretty bad, sorry. All right. Is that becoming legible, or am I just, is that better? Sort of? Bigger. I guess I could use the control keys, right? <laughs> hey, I'm doing well on time, guys. Come on. <laughs> All right. So, so I authenticated. Then I'm going to basically 
uh, I've put curl commands inside this script, so I can just run uh, run one quickly. So I'll just do the API uh, listing memory. This will run. It will dump like here's a JSON string with with the data, and here's what the script looks like. Again, just one curl command to use the cookie that the API generated, um, and then you know run a request that I put in a JSON file called get mem, and that request is uh, essentially what I copied from from Arc, right after I did my massaging of the request. So I have my metrics now uh, coming from the API, uh, and. Uh, so, again, this is, uh, how do you guys usually handle JSON command line? <laughs> what? Yeah, so that, that's what I had to use too. But I kind of felt stupid using it. Uh, I don't know why. It just, you know, I'm kind of like a sad awk guy, and I'm like, this, this just doesn't feel natural at all. But anyway, so I had to use uh, JQ to... Uh, and again, you know, like, pardon my ignorance here, but, you know, <laughs> I use it as a hammer. Give me a response and pretty fight, and then I'm going to use my, you know, uh, my mad Linux skills to get what I need out of you. So, isn't, isn't there anything better than, than JQ? Wow. So, anyway, so this will dump the data points that I want. And... Uh, uh, basically, I put them in a file that then then is li linked to the index file, and just just to show you that I'm not cheating here. So here's the index file with the the stock data set I downloaded from D3. You refresh that, okay, okay, it looks you know like a stock file, um, and then uh, I've copied the data points from. Uh, uh I've copied the data points from the API response into a separate file that I'm going to now copy over. Let's see what it is. Uh, which one was it? Was this one? So if this works, yay, new data points. All right. And uh, again, you know, not rocket science, but it's kind of very liberating not to be locked into the different tools and what, what they're giving you. Like actually getting access, th access to the API and being able to build exactly what you want is kind of pretty cool. You're probably creating more problems if you start doing that, but you know, so what? It's already pretty bad. <laughs> so, so again, uh, that's all I wanted to show you. Again, I, uh, I kind of wanted to have more time to give more examples, but I think this hopefully illustrates that we can all get into it and kind of do some cool, uh, cool stuff with APIs and make the problems even harder and more encoded in our brains. So, thank you. Does anybody have any questions for Biko? I don't need to wait on you to create this widget for this particular data source because you don't feel like it. I can go and do it myself and do it in a couple hours. It's not that hard, right? Uh, now, some tools that are particularly stubborn, you know, 
uh, especially legacy tools, particular some legacy tools are especially stubborn with APIs, um, and they're kind of out of luck. But most modern tools have APIs. You can get to the data. You can kind of unlock yourself to to build what you need. Um, and for example, if you pick like an aggregation layer like Grafana or Wavefront, they already come up, they already ship with a lot of plugins. So maybe you can solve 90% of the problem already. But in some cases, you have to do, you know, you have to build custom stuff. So, all right, guys, thank you. Yeah, one more question. Oh yeah, yeah. D D3 is awesome, and again, I didn't, um, I didn't have necessarily. Uh, all the time to give like some cooler examples, but depending on how interesting the data is that you're retrieving from the API, again, there's a. And actually, here's a little secret. I think most of the <laughs> most of the the vendors that you're already using, whether open source or paid, they, they're already probably using that as well. So, uh, I don't know. Did that answer your question? Or yeah, but I, I love D3, and it's they made it just so easy to to get started with. So. Cool. Yeah. Five minutes. Last questions. Yeah. All right. So uh, just quick raise of hands, like if there's an open space tomorrow uh, and we continue this topic, how many of you guys could be interested in that? Well, it doesn't exist yet. <laughs> yeah. Well, the, the topic will be about the dip, the monitoring tool chain, how it's like, what do we do with it? What you know. Cool. All right, awesome. Well, expect an open space tomorrow then. Thank you. <laughs>